Well, the Rosetta pattern, I think, came to me over a, quite a long period of time, the way a lot of ideas internalize inside you and suddenly begin to pop up. It started out pretty much just with doodles. The fascinating thing about shells is that they showed me that the interior forms, the voids and the hollows and the concave forms in these pieces, can relay directly to the external forms and that they don't have to be separate. And what's fascinating to me is to, to find ways to make things so different, solids versus voids, flat surfaces versus holes to find those things that are all part of the same original form. Here's a case where the external surface of the shell starts off almost as a flat ribbon and winds around, becomes convex, works its way inside itself, is almost kind of a rolling convex form and at the last minute becomes a concave negative void. And this continues going back and forth depending on the, the plane we slice it. If I were a, a composer, I might want to compose certain types of musical themes for a vocal group and another type of theme for a brass quintet. And it's pretty much the same in sculpture. Different materials lend themselves to different possibilities. Part of the link between the rounded organic and biological forms and the kind of clean and pure geometric forms in sculpture appears in what I call a rosetta. It's essentially four loops, sometimes at right angles to themselves, or you could consider it four loops inside a circle or opposing pairs of ellipses. One ellipse pair being here, and then the other pair of ellipses in blue relating this way. This is when that simple form of the four loops becomes much more rounded and sculptural. If you begin to think of the four loops as four holes or voids, then you begin to see one strut coming across the other. And this is the link or the connection between the seashells and the musical patterns that I like to develop in my work. With this marble sculpture, you can see how the original Rosetta form has defined the four loops. The fourth one coming out here and coming back in, but leaving an opening so the viewer can look down into the core of the piece and see the origins of the forms as they relate to this loop. The other side of this form, instead of having these two tails as the core or the crux of that side, do a flip-flop, come back onto themselves and continue throughout the piece, although it still is one continuous form. You're looking at a very special piece of wood, as you can guess. It's been lathed into a spherical form after three separate but grain-mashed blocks of mahogany have been joined together and it's ready now for carving in this state. Carving is kind of an extraordinary branch of sculpture compared to, for example, modeling with clay or wax or constructing with built-up blocks of steel welded together. Carving has a 
kind of a two-sided quality. It's, it's something that has to come from inside where you have to envision what's in there. And of course, you can never glue a chip back once you've taken it out. It's gone forever. So it takes a certain amount of careful bravado to know exactly what you're doing with carving. There's no putting it back on. But one way to get around that is to use something which isn't quite as precious, where you can make your mistakes and try your experiments and be free to really play around with it. I use styrofoam because it's light and cheap and easy to work. And what would take, say, 200 hours or more to carve by hand in a block of mahogany might only take a day or two to explore in styrofoam. So this is the carver's way to sanity. The idea of this is to use the original Rosetta theme. If you look inside there, you can see it almost making four loops. They're just beginning to appear now. And those four loops are the same four loops as the Rosetta was, except now the topology of the forms is turned inside out. So what we're doing is inverting the whole form, turning it inside out and placing it inside a sphere so it has a boundary and it's an understandable format. In this case, the struts themselves are flat on the outside and have the edge running inside them. No visit to a studio would be complete without a look at some of the mistakes and problems that are behind the completed pieces you see in a gallery. This is an example of a styrofoam prototype I was working with where I tried to investigate a direction and it just didn't pan out. Here's a typical theme of this strut being defined by one edge from that direction and another edge from the opposite direction passing each other through the center of the strut. It worked out well on this side except as I turn this around, you'll see it begin to disintegrate. You'll see this edge follow itself around this bulbous form and dissipate into nothingness. In fact, the temptation is for the, the eye to want to join it up with an entirely different edge coming from somewhere else. That's one problem with the piece. And the other problem was my attempt to join this edge and this edge together. And really break deliberately one of the rules of sculpture, which is that every edge has to come from somewhere and lead to somewhere else. And when two things join up, it has to be handled very, very carefully, or it, it doesn't succeed. So here's a case where the composer was trying to put together a, a horn concerto and a, an a cappella work all in the, with a different orchestra completely and ended up with just too much. It didn't pan out, although here you are back to the original theme, which eventually led to several other pieces which did work out, and some of these pieces you may be looking at now. gratifying times to a carver is when you get to the point without the mallet where you're just using the motion of your body and your hand and finger movement. It all kind of ties in through your eyes and it's a beautiful kinesthetic feeling. Naturally, this is my favorite part of the whole process. Especially when you get down into the core of the piece. Now I'm gonna, I'll try to 
try it from underneath a little more with my hand. This is the joy of carving when you're not quite at the brain surgeon stage, but every slice has got a rhythm of its own and it's almost like the wood talking back. You can tell when it's on your side. fine rasping because that's where you make the very, very intricate decisions in the work where a 64th of an inch or a slight wobble on a surface or aberration on an edge has to be repaired then and there or, or never. It takes a lot of concentration but it's also gratifying because when something is perfect, it's perfect. Of course, it's also finished. Being with a piece of sculpture is like being with another person. I've always been struck by the presence that a piece of sculpture can have. I'd like to think that you could converse with a good work and that it would talk back to you. It'd be playful and it'd move around with you and that you could relate to it on a number of different levels and planes. It's touchable, and of course from a distance, it's also very visual. <laughs>